Yeah. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I am very pleased this morning to introduce Professor Tibor McCann, um, who is one of the most remarkable uh, living libertarian philosophers. Indeed, perhaps he is the most remarkable libertarian philosopher. He has published 35 books on a whole range of subjects. Um, I don't like to use the hackney phrase Renaissance man because it has been so grossly overused usually apply to people who don't deserve it, but I think Tibor does deserve it. Uh, not only is he intellectually distinguished, but his life has been rather more interesting than the common run of philosophy professors. He made his escape from communist Hungary in 1953, I think. Um, a sad... A snuggled up. A sad loss for Hungary, but a gain for the world. And um, I, I therefore wish to introduce to you Professor Tibor McCann, who, who will talk about the philosophy of Ayn Rand, I think it is. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate the invitation. I was here about five, seven years ago uh, at a, another one of these meetings, so I'm not totally unfamiliar with the uh, Libertarian Alliance. I was then um, into, uh, brought here by Chris Tame, who was a very sweet guy I uh, had the honor of knowing. I knew um, also Norm Barry, who was associated with the organization. Um, I have been a, inspired considerably by the works of Ayn Rand. Uh, over the years, ever since 1961, when I first encountered her, uh, oddly enough, before I ever knew anything about her as a literary or philosophical figure, I had uh, been a part of a performance of the night of January 16th, um, because uh, at Andrews Air Force Base, near the President's uh, near the White House, outside in Maryland. Uh, I was stationed there, and we started a little theater group, Andrews Players. And one of the plays we put on was Night of January 16th. And you know, if you know anything about that play, it has a gimmick about it, because at each performance, they select a jury from the audience. So they don't know how the play ends. Uh, the uh, particular jury that was selected is the one that determines the ending of the play. And then there is a lot of argument, uh, both within the audience and the cast, as to how it ought to have gone. And we did that every night of the performance. We stayed up until 2, 3 in the morning arguing about what should have happened in that play or in the jury trial. Oh, and only about a year or two years later did I realize that this uh, author who wrote Night, Je Night of January 16th was this crazy woman named Ayn Rand. And uh, I started to read more of her works. Um, I had read a review by Gore Vidal of For the New Intellectual. Uh, Gore Vidal wrote this review, I believe it was for Esquire magazine, and slammed Ayn Rand. And at that time, I was sort of saying, wow, wonderful, um, another one down the drain. And I went to two of these guys uh, on the base who used to study Rand quite openly at chow halls and various places, service clubs. And I said, look what a nice job Gore Vidal did on your hero. And uh, they said, well, have you ever read her? And I said, no. And they said, before you make a judgment, maybe you ought to. And I thought, well, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so I then uh, launched into the reading of The Fountainhead, and uh, I started to really find myself captivated by the ideas, by the style, um, no doubt, it had a little bit to do with the fact that I myself came from a communist country, Hungary. Um, but when I finally met Ayn Rand in 1962, for about a half hour before I went west to um, become an undergraduate at Claremont, 
Um, I mentioned to her that perhaps the reason I am uh, so sympathetic toward her novels is that I too come from a communist country. She promptly scolded me for that. And she said, you know, my ideas are universal. They're not confined to the particulars of my own history. And that was an interesting comment because later on, of course, in informal logic, you learn about the genetic fallacy, which is to examine an idea not on the basis of its meaning and its truth, but on the basis of its origin. And Rand uh, reminded me that if I am going to uh, look at those ideas critically, it has to be independent of uh, where she was born and her particular upbringing, especially if she's going to deal with ideas in a, at least a modestly uh, philosophical way. And over the years, as I have myself um, graduated from various places uh, with a major in philosophy, uh, it really does prove uh, true that uh, the background that one has that may have inspired one to read a book does not determine what one will think of that book. And uh, as much as one is tempted to in this age of sociology and the age where everybody's um, beliefs and behavior tend to be explained away by historical contingencies, it's interesting to still hold out for the notion that what really matters about a thinker is whether the ideas proposed uh, make sense and then whether they are true. Uh, this, by the way, is also a big debate uh, surrounding the political scientist, the late Leo Strauss, who is noted for reviving the study of the classics because he got sick and tired of the fact that everybody wanted to explain Socrates and Plato and Aristotle uh, by reference to the various contingencies of ancient Greek civilization instead of examining the ideas that they have put forth and seeing whether those ideas have merit. Um, so anyway, that was my little personal history with Rand. I had uh, subsequently had some exchanges with her um, in which she um, was very supportive of some of what I did and at one point slammed me down and ever since then I have been persona non grata which is actually turns out to be something of a of a honor to have been blackballed by the Rand group. Uh, I joined some very famous people in this. I was never that famous but I did experience this ostracism. Uh, the reason was that I wrote a letter in which I was critical, but also probably a little bit um, huffy, let's say that. Uh, so uh, Rand probably just didn't want to put up with some uh, two-bit pipsqueak from the West Coast uh, bugging her about her grand ideas. She's always thought that she had grand ideas since she was about two, so uh, it was very difficult to have a conversation with her in which you were treated like you had anything to contribute. Um, well, you know, maybe geniuses have a right to think that way. I mean, you look at all these people whom uh, people tend to admire, Wittgenstein, Freud, Popper, uh, and a lot. They all generate these acrimonious uh, communities around them who denounce one another, divorce each other, and so forth and so on. And uh, it seems to be something about these characters with grand ideas and with a lot of ego that does not make for easy companionship. And that's true about the Rain group too. So uh, what I got out of that little experience is never mind the personal story, never mind the divorces, never mind who slept with whom, just see whether the, the woman has anything to contribute. And so I decided in my undergraduate years to go into philosophy and actually take a good look at whether this uh, novelist who didn't have a training in formal philosophy, in academic philosophy, who actually scoffed at much of contemporary philosophy and also the philosophy of the history, uh, could stand the ground against those like, uh, you know, Descartes and Hume and Kant and uh, Spencer and Hegel and all of these characters. So I decided to undertake a uh, education in those in, in philosophy 
And I must say, I emerged from it not having to uh, be ashamed of my admiration for Rand's thinking. It may not have been as refined as that of a Gilbert Ryle or a um, Hillary Putnam, but when you get past some of the um, razzmatazz of contemporary philosophical jargon, you'll see that Rand is, Rand is very much a contender, if not, in fact, an out-and-out -out winner. Now, a couple of people in the history of philosophy, especially recent philosophy, uh, kind of attest to the fact that Rand is onto something because these people, too, end up with very similar views that Rand has in technical philosophy. I'm not talking now about you know, capitalism, egoism, and so forth. I'm talking about free will, metaphysics, um, epistemology, and so forth and so on. And um, I'll, I'll drop a few names in case you um, want to. You might want to write some of these down and Google them uh, just to take a look at what these people are saying and why do I associate them with Ayn Rand's works. Uh, I, the first person who comes to mind is um, J.L. Austin, one of the um, uh, linguistic, uh, I mean, the philosophy of language uh, theorists from Oxford, very famous in the 50s, um, wrote How to Do Things with Words, Sense and Sensibilia, and a number of other interesting books, especially a uh, path-breaking breaking article in uh, epistemology called Other Minds. This article refers in its title to that traditional problem of how do you know that other people have minds and all you can actually do, uh, observe is their bodies moving about. So how do you then make the leap or the judgment that they actually have a mind rather than they're just these uh, robots around you and you are the only one with a mind. And this, out of this, uh, Austin then develops a very challenging approach to the concept of knowledge which uh, shares a good deal with Rand's own approach to that idea. Because one of the things that Rand notices about the history of philosophy is that knowledge had been conceived too readily as a sort of a final picture of something. So if I know um, say London, then I must have the perfect, timeless, up-to-date, final picture of it, which cannot be improved upon. And if I even can conceive of an improvement, then I don't truly know London. Uh, this comes out in ordinary discussions without philosophers muddying things up by people asking things like, are you absolutely certain and if you then sort of recoil saying, am I absolutely certain? I don't know. Uh, instead of saying, go to hell, I am certain enough, as certain as a human being needs to be in order to know it. And this is what Rand and Austin had in common. They both educated us about how we should not demand too much of knowledge and nor too little of it. Uh, there are others. Ermsen, uh, he's a sort of a neo Wittgensteinian. He wrote a very nice little piece back in the 50s called On Grading, which was a reintroduction of normative philosophy after the positivists have practically put it to rest and laid it aside as dead forever. Because back then it was like, you cannot observe ought, then there is no ought. So uh, Ermsen comes back, oh, this is not the same kind of thing, and wrote this wonderful little piece. And I remember when I ran across it, I said, you know, Rand and Ermsen would get along. They may not uh, drink at the same bars, but nevertheless, their general idea of how to think of normative judgments is very um, similar. There are others, even Wittgenstein, uh, who wrote a book that was posthumously published called On Certainty. And if you read through all certain, it's written in the same style as philosophical investigations with a bunch of aphorisms, questions and answers and so on, sort of like Nietzsche wrote. 
Uh, but the substance of uncertainty is extremely interesting because it uh, rescues philosophy from the grips of a sort of silly, fanatical skepticism, uh, the kind that we inherited from Descartes, where you imagine evil demons and so on, and whether they can distort logic for you, and then you find yourself in a fix where the only thing that you know is that you uh, are a thinking thing of some sort, but not a body. Um, and so Wittgenstein goes through this whole thing and basically shows that in order to have meaningful doubts where you are entitled to be doubtful about something, you have to have reasons for the doubt. It's not enough to fantasize the doubt. So it should be like, you know beyond a reasonable doubt, but you don't need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's sort of my way of clarifying the issue. Uh, you don't have to resist people who say, but isn't it logically possible that you are really a zebra? Um, hmm, why would it be logical? Well, because there's no out-and-out -out formal contradiction in saying McCann is a zebra. And then I'm supposed to fall down and worship them forever. And uh, this is not the case. And Wittgenstein helps us understand that. And the Randian view is very close to that. Uh, there are many others. There are, there's a wonderful uh, philosopher who used to teach at the University of uh, North Carolina named W.D. Falk. And Falk defends both classical egoism as well as rejects the is-ought gap, which is a major advance in meta-ethics, the area where you try to figure out whether moral judgments and political judgments could be given a sensible defense so that you don't just emote when you say that murder is bad, you know. Um, and uh, Falk was, um, uh, had this, he has never written a book, but they collected all his essays into a book and it is really a fabulous work. And once again, uh, you read it, you see that Rand is uh, way ahead of some of these people with her works. So uh, I mention this because over the years, even within classical liberal circles, I have encountered quite a few philosophers, officially uh, academic philosophers, who basically have scoffed at Rand and put her down and said, ah, you know, what the hell, Rand is not really that big a deal. Uh, one was Jan Narvison, a friend of mine from the University of Waterloo in Canada, who wrote a piece for Reason Papers, the journal that I used to edit, in which the other one was Lauren Lomaski, who very paradoxically, even though he thought very little of Ayn Rand, and in fact, I have a book in which uh, I quote an email that he sent me, uh, putting her down royally, uh, then later on went to the University of Virginia on money contributed by an enthusiast about objectivism, and now he is holding this chair which has been established in honor of Ayn Rand, the very philosopher he thinks doesn't amount to very much, which is kind of an interesting development. I don't know why. I, if I would ever take a chair from someone whom I thought was uh, worthless. Um, anyway, there are some others, but let me mention some other people who, in the contemporary philosophical landscape, uh, have come around, not explicitly to embrace Rand's views, but in fact, to articulate views that are very much like that of Ayn Rand. Uh, amongst them um, would be a man now dead, David Norton, who wrote a book called Personal Destinies, A Philosophy of Ethical Individualism, a fabulous work, and very much along lines of Rand's sort of uh, neo-eudaimonistic um, ethics. Uh, unfortunately, a great many people, when they hear the term egoism, they think Hobbesian egoism, or the kind of thing that you know economists embrace, where egoism really means you do whatever the hell you please, 
and as long as nobody object, uh, nobody uh, obstructs your actions, you are now acting egoistically. And of course, land meant something much more uh, complicated and, uh, and demanding by ethical egoism. Uh, mainly, uh, she meant that uh, you, as a human being, have a moral responsibility to make the most out of your human life as the individual human being you are, which is where the egoism comes from. But it's a classical egoism, not a modern Hobbesian sort of a narrow uh, subjective egoism. And uh, Norton uh, lays this out extremely well and inspiringly and so much it's delightful read this book called Personal Destinies. But it's not just Norton. There are some stars in um, contemporary um, British philosophy, like Philip of Foot, who not long ago published a book called Natural Goodness. And if you read through this little book, it is almost a plagiarism of the virtue of selfishness. Rand's book of 19... Uh, 64, I believe it was. Um, it is very naturalistic, meaning it depends on a knowledge of human nature for laying out the criteria for a good human life. And uh, it's amazing how uh, this happened because back in about uh, the late 70s, early 80s, I knew Philippa Foot. She was a professor both at Oxford and at UCLA, and I had known her boyfriend, Sidney Trivis, and we used to go out to dinner, and I used to defend Rand, and she used to sort of put her down, um, and I said, but wait a minute, you, you completely agree with Rand, what, what's this? Well, it wasn't fashionable to embrace Rand if you're an Oxford uh, philosopher, because Rand is obviously a peasant, and they are all uh, snooty little bastards, you know? So, uh, so Rand was, uh, dismissed by her, and then she wrote a book 20 years later in which the Randian meta-ethics and ethics is laid out almost perfectly, but of course Rand is not mentioned. Um, I actually lived in her apartment and just a little gossipy thing, uh, Foote was very famous for not having any books in her houses. She refused to have any books. Apparently she thought she didn't need them. Uh, I don't really know why. Uh, most of us in the philosophy profession have books around the house, but she didn't. That was just a little side issue. Then there are others. Uh, for example, uh, Martha Nussbaum, who's also a philosopher, uh, very famous um, on the international uh, political egalitarian scene. Nussbaum is actively involved with Amartya Sen's efforts to change the world into an egalitarian arena where everybody is provided with what he needs, not what he's got a right to, or he's got a right to anything he needs. Uh, essentially, this is the capabilities approach. Um, he got the Nobel Prize in economics for this uh, point of view, Sen did. I know Sen reasonably well, I just by luck I happened to run into him when I was teaching at UC Santa Barbara. He came there, he's an extremely sweet guy, it's wonderful to argue with him because nothing turns into name calling or acrimony, no matter how badly you disagree with Sen, it always remains at a very civilized and even joyful level. You just take joy in the fact that you are both thinkers and are worried about ideas, and so I was very pleased to have made his acquaintance, but uh, I, he and Martha Nussbaum have been involved in this UN project of securing for people uh, not what Peter Bauer argued for, namely freedom and free trade and free entry into the market so that they can exercise their own initiative but more uh, the kind of entitlement mentality that is ruining most of the Western countries. That's my view, that's not Sen's view, obviously. Uh, there are others um, uh, in the area of psychology and psychophysics. There was a man at uh, Cal State, uh, uh, no, California, California Institute of Technology named Roger W. Sperry. 
You will probably remember uh, one of the things that he did for which he got a Nobel Prize, and that is the split brain experiments. He was noted for that, but he also defended a view of free will, which is not very popular amongst many others in the neuroscientific community, which is now a very big community, and it tends to lean in the direction of determinism, but not with full confidence. There are people like Steven Pinker and others who also embrace a bit of agent causation, which comes out of Rand's very minimalist state, but nevertheless avid defense of human free will. Uh, Rand hitches a wagon to the old philosopher of the early 20th century named W something Joseph. I don't know the whole a bunch of uh, initials that he has, but Joseph was an Aristotelian, and he maintained that it's the human being, the organism, you, I, who causes things. So that when, in common sense, we say that Mozart's symphonies were produced by Mozart, and not by a series of uh, endless causal events that go back to infinity, uh, Sperry said that that was a sensible way of thinking of causation, that one should not reduce causation to just one type of cause, the kind of mechanical causation that you witness on a pool table when the billiard balls hit, hit each other, but there are a variety of causes, and one of the causes amongst this variety is agent causation. The agent makes things happen. Uh, and, and that's what Rand defends in a minimalist way, but that is what Sperry defended uh, as a psychophysicist with a great many, uh, a, a considerable input from his science of psychophysics. There are others, um, let me just say a few more just in case you wanted to um, uh, explore these. I don't know whether you remember, but there was a woman in America named Hazel Barnes who was a kind of translator of existentialism for Anglos, uh, Anglo-American audiences. Uh, in her book on existentialism, she has a complete chapter on Ayn Rand. Nobody ever mentions this, knows this, but she very early recognized that Rand's philosophy made a serious contribution to humanistic studies, that Rand was no chump. Um, there was, uh, in the philosophy of science, an English man named Ram Hare. Uh, there is, um, in, at Harvard, Hilary Putnam, who's sort of hinting at an Aristotelian conception of definitions, which is an interesting neo-Aristotelian idea, and a Randian definition of, uh, of, of um, um, nature, human nature, which is one thing that the contemporary philosophical community is searching for. They have sort of given up the, their, their extreme skepticism of the concept of the nature of something for a very long time uh, that just couldn't be made sense of. I don't know if you remember, but in Wittgenstein it was called a family resemblance. That's as close as you could come to a definition, is to provide some kind of description that amounted to a family resemblance. But right now they're sort of reviving the old, uh, almost naturalistic definitions in philosophy, whereby you can then go back and arrest ethics, and especially politics, like Locke did, on human nature the Declaration of Independence, and so on. This has fallen into disrepute over the last 200 years, but no longer so, not at least amongst some of the most uh, active and uh, prominent philosophers. Rand is, unbeknownst to her and unbeknownst to many of the people who support Rand, being revived in different garb. Um, what else? There are some people uh, I like to mention this because it always tickles my fancy. Uh, Rand is often uh, put down or criticized or scoffed at because she is so uh, livid. You know, she denounces people, she writes critical pieces where she makes no bones about the character of the people whose pieces she's criticizing. And, uh, this sort of supposed to disqualify her from being a polite participant in academic philosophy. But in fact, if you look at some of the 
stars in academic philosophy, amongst them a man named Stanley Cavell at Harvard University, they have written exactly this kind of literature in philosophy. Cavell wrote a blistering review of a book on Wittgenstein, denouncing the author left and right as a plagiarist, as a fraud, as everything. And this is a, in an academic journal, you know. Uh, and I, when I was reading this, I said, wow, if it's done from Harvard, it's perfectly acceptable. If it's done from the uh, San Fernando Valley, I guess it's not. Uh, but Rand is not in bad company here. Um, there is a psychologist named Bernard Bars, who's a neuroscientist, who's also very close to Rand in his picture of the human mind. Now, the people who are not so pleased are these Lomaski and uh, Narvison, and I don't know why not, but I guess they didn't particularly like them. I mean, I have this suspicion, having been in the philosophical community and having experienced the kind of uh, demeaning outlook that people give me when I mention Ayn Rand, and you know, the idea is to quote her in a philosophy journal is just like death. Uh, although I did very early in a piece that I wrote for the American Philosophical Quarterly, and Nicholas Rescher, the then editor of the uh, journal, was very kind and didn't find that at all objectionable because it was on point. And some philosophers have the integrity that if Rand is on point, quote her, you know. If she's not, then don't quote her. It has nothing to do with whether she was an anti-communist or an egoist or had a very heavy Russian accent. Um, now, there are three or four new books on Ayn Rand. In fact, there are two that just came out. One of them is called The um, Goddess of the Market, uh, Ayn Rand and the World She Made, I think it's called, uh, by Jennifer Burns, and it was published by Oxford, which is really a breakthrough. Oxford University Press does not usually lend its name to some hack. And so this sort of suggests that in the general culture, academic culture, Rand is gaining ground uh, about 25 years after she died. Uh, another book is by Ann C. Heller called, uh, I believe it's called Ayn Rand and uh, uh, her relation to the American right or something like that. I'm not absolutely sure. I don't remember titles that well. But that was published by Doubleday. And as we speak, it's coming out right now. It's, there's already some uh, copies of it floating about, which I have one. And uh, both of these are very formidable, thorough biographies of a woman who uh, seemed like was going to be uh, cast aside by the mainstream academic intellectual community, but apparently the enormous sales of Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead simply could not be resisted by the editors at Oxford University Press and Doubleday any longer. So they caved in and decided to publish books on her. Uh, this happens sometimes. The academic uh, publishing world is not, uh, not entirely immune to fads. Uh, the other one was, of course, Chris Cabara's book, Ru uh, Ayn Rand, The Russian Radical, which came out from the uh, Pennsylvania University Press uh, several years ago. Now, all of these uh, biographies tend to focus, in my view, and I can't defend this fully, kind of have to trust me that I'm not lying to you, a bit too much on Rand's particular history instead of an examination of her ideas. Uh, this is what I mentioned to you before, that she protested so much, uh, the genetic fallacy. She would have wished to be studied as someone who produced fabulous or flawed ideas, but ideas nonetheless and not always go, you know, every line saying, and that thought that came up in objectivism uh, came out of her, uh, you know, elementary school years in Leningrad. You know, it's, just, it's, a, it's a really irritating thing, and I know myself because when I came west, I was smuggled out when I was 14 
from Budapest by a professional smuggler, and eventually I ended up in the university uh, at, in the United States, and any time I made any comments about the Soviets or the communists or even the Nazis, I was dismissed on, oh well, you know, because you were born back there, no wonder you are totally biased. Like, no human being can escape these historical facts about him and maybe think independently. This sort of is a built-in sociological approach to understanding one's thinking. And it's a very widely uh, practiced approach, and there is something to argue about it. I mean, do our, uh, does our history make us think we do? But of course, the libertarian movement is filled with people from all corners of the world, Africa, Asia, Scandinavia, Australia, New Zealand, um, Canada, the US, Britain, and so on. So are all these people somehow infected with the anti-communist gene? But these people, I don't why understand. Why do just dismiss? On, on, the, on the other hand, if you come from El Salvador and your tyrant was a right-winger, then your testimonials are always extremely reliable. And just go figure that out for yourself. Uh, finally, I want to mention that even Rand on logic, kind of a neo-Aristotelian view of the source of logic being reality and not manufactured, as the pragmatists argue, and as, uh, um, what's his name, Nagel did, and uh, C.I. Lewis did that logic is an invention, a game that we created, and it happens to work for us, but there is no tie between logic and reality. This has been challenged in a big book by Fred Summers, also for Oxford University Press, and uh, that was about 20 years ago, and once again, if you look through that book, you'll realize that this Randian uh, conception of logic as kind of mirroring the found fundamental principles of reality is once again back in some measure of vogue, not completely uh, triumphant, but close, close. Now, um, I've given you a lot, a lot of names, a lot of associations. None of this, of course, shows Rand to be right about anything. I did not come here to try to do that in uh, a, a little bit of time that I have at my disposal to address you. I have written myself a couple of books. One is my little book for Peter Lang called Ayn Rand, which came out in 1999 and it was revised in 2001. And finally, something that uh, I edited this um, in 2005, Ayn Rand at 100. And this is a bunch of nifty essays in it by philosophers and others. Uh, and it's worth looking at. Anybody who does not just want to remain at the stage of being inspired by Rand, being excited by her, or being appalled by her because they don't like her as sort of uh, didactic fiction. She certainly is no James Joyce, although her We the Living is a novel that uh, sort of breaks from her other novels in significant ways. And, kind of exhibit certain 20th century habits of writing fiction. Anyway, Rand is uh, someone who may or may not make it through history, but in my estimation, she deserves to be looked at seriously and only uh, dismissed if the arguments warranted, rather than because she was one of the very first intellectuals who figured out that the Soviet Union was not a happy, wonderful experiment in human social life. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Professor McCann for a speech that was both trenchant and scholarly. And um, I'm sure that there are some questions in the room. Now, quite often um, I look around the room and I recognize everybody in it. This year I don't. So if you could um, introduce yourself and ask me your question, I'd be most grateful. Uh, questions? Is that Hugo Hadlow? Stand up. Shall we try? Yes. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, you said that uh, you've been identifying conclusions that other philosophers reached independently of Rand, uh, right. who came to the same conclusions as Rand. This doesn't similar to ones. I wouldn't say same. That's a bit over the okay. top. But even if they were same or very similar, um, right? The reasoning is different, and this doesn't indicate Rand as a philosopher. So. Uh, what do you think about Rand's reasoning? Could you give some examples? Rand's what? Rand's argument. <laughs> what do I think? Well, that's a kind of a press conference question, which, what's the which point? I mean, I, I like them. Obviously, I wrote books on her. I wrote my various books from a similar perspective, which I think is sound. Uh, I call myself a neo-objectivist simply because I don't want to cause any fuss with the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, <laughs> They're always so catty about these things. It really is tiresome how often these uh, people with this you know, great leader get into these squabbles. But as I say, it's not unique to the objectivist movement at all. It's all over the place. And uh, I think that Rand, you know, actually here's the deal. I have been at this for so long that for me, I don't think of um, objectivism as a frame of reference from which I see things. I see what I see. There's a bird over there by that window, and I think there is a window there, and I think my eyes are still good enough that they actually perceive that window. And uh, so I'm an objectivist. Now, you know, kill me for it. But what the hell are you going to do? Are you going to say, it's in my mind, I created the bird, you know? All this crap just does not sit well with me. And I think that in some respects, Ayn Rand really follows in the footstep of someone like Thomas Reed, a kind of common sense approach to reality and the human being's relationship to it, even in her egoism. What is her egoism about? It says, when you get up in the morning, Start taking good care of yourself. Wow! Is that some kind of a radical, anti-social stance? Or is it a sensible advice to people? And then when you're taking care of yourself, then maybe you should take care of those people who are close to you, who you sworn uh, responsibility for, and then maybe some strangers if they're in dire need of you. You know, there's this little thing in airport, in airlines when they, when they, when you first take off, they say, well, if there is a problem with breathing, first put the thing on your nose and then put it on your uh, child's nose. Well, I, you know, that makes sense. Without being able to help, you're not gonna be able to help, right? And uh, on the other hand, why shouldn't you deserve uh, first attention? There was a wonderful quote, W. Um, D. Auden said about altruism, we are put on this world to help others. What the others were put on this world for, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that pretty much sort of undermines the logic of altruism. I mean, just think, why are all those other people we're supposed to devote ourselves to so much more deserving than we are? I, I don't get it. I mean, there is a historical reason for it, because just like with original sin, it is kind of assumed that you are naturally, automatically taking care of yourself, and so you must be weaned out of that trap to be giving some attention to other people. But if you reject this hard wiring toward your own self and recognize that you grow up pretty much not knowing who the hell to do, be nice to, maybe you are a good candidate. And then others are good candidates once you've gotten to know them and recognize them and know something about them. One of the big problems with altruism is that it assumes that we can really know what other people benefit from. Well, that's a difficult thing. It takes a lot of study. Anyway, I can go on forever, so I'm not going to do that. I did see Tom Burroughs next. W would you object enormously to Tom if I let Brian Micklefay go first? Okay. So Brian Micklefay and then Tom Burroughs. Um. I, I, I was a close colleague of Chris Tame, so I let him do the Rand, and I did other stuff. So my, I only have a prejudice about Rand, which I want to put to you and ask you if you think it's got any truth to it. Um, and that was that she confused two propositions. One is 
the general proposition along the lines of the one you just said about how there is indeed a window over there, and when you looked over there, there was indeed a bird. There is an objective reality, right. and, and uh, it's pretty stupid to deny it. Common sense. With, that's one statement. The other statement is that it's obvious on lots of occasions what that objective reality consists of. And my, my understanding of Rand is that whether she expressed this in her philosophical writings or not, there are many references in her novels, which I have read, to people who refuse to accept things, rather than who just don't see them. The reason being that they should accept them, because it's clear, but they don't, they refuse to. And occasionally, when reading those novels, I would come across things which her villains refused to accept, which I also didn't accept. Okay, well, um, in other words, the truth right. is complicated, and it, it isn't necessarily sinful for people to disagree with each other about what it consists of. Uh, I don't think it's sinful, but Rand did think that when you have looked at things thoroughly and given your best shot, you ought to come up with the same conclusions. I think even libertarians believe that about liberty, for example, uh, they pretty much think that those who uh, think that slavery is a good idea or tyranny is a good idea or government regulation is a good idea have some problem somewhere. Maybe it's not a problem of uh, moral failure, but maybe a problem of not devoting enough time or not being patient enough or whatnot. And Rand did think that if you, this, and she, the word obvious that you said is, doesn't belong in Rand's vocabulary because she never uses obvious. She just says, yes, one can, but whether one will is another question. In fact, I'm right now working on a book called Why Is Everyone Else Wrong? This is my title. And it examines this problem of what, do you, what sense do you make out of the fact that a whole bunch of people disagree with you? Thousands, millions disagree with you. So evidently they are wrong because evidently you are right. You know, maybe after hard work, years of, of, of treachery, nevertheless, they're wrong and you're right. Now, how do we explain this? And her explanation was, essentially, that at bottom, if it's not some impediment of the brain or some obstruction of the natural world that prevents you from seeing things for what they are, then it is inattention, then it is evasion, then it is not taking a sustained hard enough look. That's her answer. And she, since she considers a long cunt, oddly enough, the one area of true freedom that we have is in generating the attention that we pay to the world, that is where we are free. We may not or we may, or we may sometimes, but not always, and so on. She considers that a blameworthy failure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tom Burroughs. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for that excellent uh, talk. I just also mentioned, uh, as, we, as we mentioned, other philosophers who were operating in roughly the same sort of uh -huh. uh, universe is people like Henry Veach, for example. Yes, that's right. Who's a part of this or the Aristotelian tradition, which I think... Well, of course, uh, I never mentioned the Dugs, who have written several yeah. books uh, inspired by the Randy and Outlook, although not ending up exactly there, yeah. but then you know who does. We are, yeah. you know, libertarians are individualists. And there is a little bit of a liability to being an individualist. You always want to reinvent the universe. Because obviously only you are the reliable voice of course. And, uh, anyway, go ahead. I just want to ask a question though. Um, is that it kind of like I think I'm almost wondering whether Brian was going to raise this point because he's raised it before. And I'm sure what Mummy's saying so. Is that one of the sort of key arguments you get in both the novels and indeed the non-fiction of Rand is that people who do bad things end up becoming very unhappy, and that rational self-interest pursued over the long term it takes that you actually behave honourably and civilly to other people. You don't lie. You don't cheat them, you don't rob them, you don't attack them, that you actually trade with them instead, that you actually pursue a productive life, and that's how you get happy. Um, now, I'm not going to name the particular individual concern, but I've had a recent experience of people, of a person who was seemingly sane through life, who was happy as a sandman, and who was a complete arse. 
He, he is lied to me on a number of different levels, and he's just, you know, there's, there's no apparent um, fly in the ointment in his life. And so how does an objectivist or a neo-objectivist or do why? 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 Okay. Deal with people who okay. are. I deal with it this way: that one swallow does not a springtime make. That's the way I deal with it. You, you can have some exceptional cases. You can also have people whose cheerfulness is made, made mistaken for happiness. For Rand, as for Aristotle, a happy human being had a sort of profound sense of his worth and success in life which did not mean a flawless life, which did not mean a, law, a life without pain, without sorrow. Just mean, it, it means it's as good as it gets if you pay attention, if you are a rational being. Uh, now, one thing about those exceptional cases is that Rand might say, hey, but they would be much better off if they were genuine, rational egoists. Imagine! In addition to their cheery disposition, they could also have a profound sense of pride in how well they have done in life. I, I don't necessarily buy this. There are people like Eric Mack and uh, Doug Rasmussen who have disputed this in the pages of the Journal of Ayn Rand Studies, and we have gone in back and forth on this. This is a little bit of a technical issue. But, you know, overall, most people who have signed up or Rand or objectivism or so on, I think would testify that on the whole their life has turned out better than what it would have been under the alternative. I was uh, earlier when I was a kid a Roman Catholic and yes it was constantly uh, a, a, a battle to overcome guilt for almost any feeling that I ever had, good or bad. And uh, that is missing in this neo-Aristotelian naturalism where your human nature is seen as a genuinely um, positive aspect of the world. Thank you. There, now, there are two gentlemen at the back. Uh, the one at the far back, whose face I'm afraid I can't see. You mean the man with the glass? Oh, the man with the glasses. That's it. Christopher Bevis. That's it. I'd be interested to know what you think Anne Rand's message has for, to offer people who are more comfortable seeing themselves predominantly as followers rather than leaders, and how, if at all, your thoughts, your message would differ from hers. Well, Ayn Rand, like many others, had a little bit of a tendency to embrace the one-size-fits-all fallacy. Um, that's one of the reasons we got, you know, the greatest uh, artists are Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers or Rachmaninoff or something. Uh, there is this tendency to say if, if I uh, appreciate it, if I really am turned on by these people, everybody else must be. And I, I think that's a problem. That's a difficulty with Rand. It's a difficulty with many, many, many other thinkers who respect themselves, who like themselves, and, you know, I love the color, color orange, as you can see my ring. I really don't believe everybody ought to wear an orange ring. I sometimes I recognize that true, but my philosophical yeah. discipline tells me that that would be a silly conclusion. Uh, geniuses don't have that discipline most of the time because they're so damn smart, they can't imagine themselves ever being wrong, so there's a flaw there. But I think, but I think that Rand his, uh, has this problem of making recommendations a little bit uh, rushed, a little. I call this in my very first book I wrote, the pseudoscience of B. F. Skinner, the blow up fallacy. You see something in the world that you get really clearly. You take a picture of it, you enlarge it, and you think you now know the world. Uh, we are tempted to do that. It's, you know, so I, I don't think Re Rand is flawless in this, but um, I think she's corrigible. If she just cooled down, took some Valium, I think she might get into a conversation where she saw this a problem, 
But it's, you know, she was, you gotta remember this woman was completely denounced and rejected and ridiculed when she said, the Soviets are not nice guys. Everybody said the Soviets are nice guys. And she wouldn't buy it. And she was hated the rest of her life for bringing that to light. She's still, by a great many people on the left, treated as guilty of having besmirched this wonderful uh, utopian dream. And she got kind of testy, uh, not even in her old age, in her young age. She was a kind of a uh, curmudgeon, if you want to use a term. And so what? I mean, you know, we, we are libertarians. We recognize that there are many types of people who have a place in a free society. Rand's personality traits don't interest me that much. And so when people point them out to me, I said, huh, so what? You know, we've got a lot of different people. We've got erudite, aristocratic sounding people like Hayek and Mises. We've got little tiny Jews like Milton Friedman, you know. We've got all kinds, you know. So Rand is not the perfect image. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I just don't get excited about that too much. Okay, we can take two more this questions. Maybe here, right in front. All right, I might say three, but the lady there, we haven't got the lady yet. Yes, yes you, you, you. Okay. Hi, uh, Lily Tannett. Um, so just a follow-up question from Matt. Uh, I think that she would argue that um, her ideas are universal and so would apply to um, other people or everyone else. Um, what do you think the reason is that they don't, or that they might not apply to some people? Well, first thinking? of all, there are universal ideas, and I would also recognize that, for example, individual rights apply to all human individuals and so on. But the size of hat that you should wear can't be generalized over to others whose hat size is different, right? So take two drastic examples. Uh, Rand is also an individualist. She's not just a humanist. She recognizes that human beings are essentially individuals. And in their individuality, many things may be right for one person that are not right for another, or wrong for one person that are not right for another, and are not wrong for another. So I think that she is more of a pluralist than your comment uh, gives the credit to her for. Okay. Uh, the gentleman there, and the last question we Richard Garner. We started late, so we'll finish a little late. I also was born in communist country, and when I was a child in secondary school, the lessons of Marxism and communist ideology and philosophy were mandatory. And my first thought was that all this leftist ideology and leftist philosophy is very similar to religion, not to science, because they are given values, given beliefs, completely artificial assumptions, and everything is built out, built on these assumptions. And if this theory is against common sense, then common sense should be should or at least jailed. Uh, that's a comment that I, you know, I can't completely address. I think that obviously Marx and his followers would think that a historical scientific materialism is different from a religion, but um, maybe the ultimate explanation in their souls is very similar to what explains the commitment that people in religion make to the tenets of that religion. Uh, I was raised by, in communist schools in Budapest. Um, I was actually ejected from a class when I raised the question of what if a friend of mine and I start with the same amount of resources, five foreigns it was, and uh, he buys a bunch of wood and builds a wonderful little table, and I buy a bunch of fabulous Hungarian wine and get under the table. Uh, now, does he have to share the proceeds and the benefits he gains from having built this table? And when I asked this question, I was 11 years old, they immediately ejected me from school and transferred me to a technical school because I was clearly infected with counter-revolutionary genes. <laughs> 
interesting. Um, Richard Garner, and then we will uh, wind up for lunch. Yeah, um, I have one question. So you, you mentioned the, the revitalization of neo aristotelian ethics and also logic um, as evidence of the continuing relevance of Rand. I was wondering how would that would, would sit with people like such as Roderick Long who have argued that one flaw with Rand is that she's not Aristotelian enough. And that would suggest that this near Aristotelian movement is moving beyond Rand. Well, I am not a student of Long's works. I have cooperated with him on reading this book on anarchism, minarchism. Uh, I don't follow his thinking about much. Um, you know, we all have, you know, we believe in a division of labor. He does this, I do that. I really don't know of, uh, I mean, I think that Rand would be better off generally if she studied more other philosophers and drew on their insights, and instead uh, of what she's doing, where she, she sort of smuggles those things in almost subconsciously, like Aquinas and you know Locke and so on. Uh, but hey, that's Rand. I'm, I'm not going to make a big, huge squabble about that. Uh, she's never been a professional philosopher. She never tried to get a PhD. She never tried to. Uh, get certified by the academic community, and as for um, her quality as an amateur but serious philosophical thinker, I think she has earned our respect, but maybe not as much as you would like, if, especially if you're an academic philosopher. Thank you very much for your patience. I appreciate it. Thank you. That was, of course, an outstanding speech, and um, I think you'll agree that it's all the more outstanding because uh, Professor McCann uh, is still somewhat jet-lagged from his flight uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, th this is not the last you'll see of him, because he will be joining us for the dinner and uh, maybe playing a part in the proceedings. So um, before we all go to lunch, I'd like to thank you for um, having, such, having been such a well-behaved audience. I would, of course, like to thank Professor McCann for, um, again, an outstanding speech. And um, I, I wish you all a very happy and enjoyable lunch. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.